Okay. Today on the show, we're lucky to have Amanda Ree, canine well-being expert and founder of Sama Dog. Amanda is a certified meditation teacher, Hatha yoga instructor, and practitioner of Ayurveda. She studied closely under Dr. Deepak Chopra and has worked as lead educator, event host, and leadership team member at the Chopra Center for Well-Being. Sama Dog was born from Amanda's desire to help guide dogs and their humans enter into a blissful state of balance through Ayurveda, the 5,000-year-old system of holistic healing from India. Amanda has also founded Soul Playmates, a dog rescue organization that helps dog adopters find and integrate rescue dogs into their family. And you can learn all about Amanda and her work at samadog.com, that's S-A-M-A dog.com, where you can take her dog dosha quiz and determine your dog's mind body type, along with recommendations for feeding, supplements, and other ways to care for your dog based on his or her mind body type. And of course, you can also follow her on Facebook at Sama Dog Wellbeing. Every Saturday she does Facebook Lives at 10 a.m. Pacific. And she's also on Instagram at Sama underscore dog underscore wellbeing. I'll put all these links in the show notes and on our Instagram page at Thriving Dog. Amanda, welcome. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here with you guys. Awesome. So uh, why don't you take a second to fill in anything I might have missed there and we'll get right into your story and, and what you do for our furry friends. No, you did a great job. That covers it. You know, that really gives a, a good intro and lets people know where to go to find more. And hopefully through this conversation, we'll leave everyone with a lot of good information that stimulates them to do exactly that, to keep exploring and diving into a different way to look at life with their dog. Yeah, super interesting because, uh, you know, on the human side, I've, I've followed Ayurveda and, you know, familiar with some of the basic principles. And it's just awesome to see those integrated into, um, you know, canine well-being as well. So very interested to, to learn all about how you've done that. Um, yeah, what's interesting is that Ayurveda is the science of life, and we'll, we'll, of course, explore this more. But that's what that word means, the science of life, or it could be understood as the science of nature. And animals, clearly, are a beautiful expression of nature. So the fact that more people have been applying Ayurveda to dogs surprised me when I first started to explore it. You know, mm -hmm. I've been studying and, and applying this to humans for so long, and then once I started to realize how it was affecting dogs or how it could affect dogs or benefit dogs. And I started to research it and saw that really there, it, it didn't exist. So the point being that it's like, it's the perfect formulation for us to understand the lifestyle of our dogs and living with them. It's really a lovely way to just expand what applies so well for such a long time and be able to bring in the rest of the family basically. Nice. So getting yeah. everyone on board. Yeah. <laughs> and where did your love of dogs begin? It began from birth when I was brought into a family that had a, uh, brought a puppy into the, the group at the same time. So Prince was about six weeks old at the time that I was born. So they just got him, they got me, and in we went to a crib slash crate. I mean, I probably didn't even know which one it was. Together, <laughs> we, both of you? <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly he was, I don't know that I was ever around the crate, but he definitely was around the crib and we grew up as babies, you know, together. And at about three years old is really, you know, so we were besties. We did everything together. I literally don't think I realized that I was not that species. What and kind of dog was he? What, what was Sheltie. What, Sheltie. Yep. Beautiful Sheltie named Prince. And um, so at about three years old, we were living in Orange County at the time, Southern California. And it was also a time where they had like, it was very popular to have these big spas, you know, pools were taking up too much space. And so everyone got these kind of large, you know, oversized um, jacuzzi tubs. Yeah. So we had one in the backyard and it had a bench that went all the way around it, of course, that everybody would sit on. Well, I, as a little girl, would like walk that bench all the time. Well, mom didn't, that was, of course, when my parents were there with me. My mom didn't realize that the back door had been left open and she was talking to my grandmother at that time, stuck to the wall, right? <laughs> and off I wandered into the garden and went into the pool probably to try to go walk around the little path. 
but without my floaties or without anybody watching and I slipped into the pool. Mm. Well, my mom finally heard some commotion and ran outside to find me soaking wet on the side of the pool, coughing up water and Prince soaking up, soaking wet on the side of the pool too. Mm. And he had never, Shelties are not known for their swimming or their love of water. So he had never done that before. He'd never gotten in. And um, so it's pretty safe to assume that I slipped in and he saved me. Wow. Yeah. So that sealed the deal at a very deep soul level. I was bonded to them and they became or continued as the best friends I'd ever had. They were everything to me. You know, many times there was difficulty in my childhood as so many of us face and our animals, my animals were the ones that held me together. To, that gave me unconditional love, that gave me companionship, that gave me someone to talk to, someone to lay next to and be comforted by. Hmm. Um, kind of makes me emotional when you think about it, you know, of how much yeah. joy and love and support they can provide to us as children. And so they definitely were that for me. And, um, and I had such a great childhood because of them. I remember a few human friends here and there, but my relationship <laughs> with the dogs was really where it was at. And my, luckily, my family really supported that and encouraged it and allowed for all the animals around the house. And then at about um, 11 years old, I think it was, um, when we had moved to Lake Tahoe, my parents decided to buy a company, a business, and wanted to have like a, you know, a locally run um, so store of some kind that we could be in the Tahoe community and engage there in that way. And they decided to buy a pet store. Of course, <laughs> I lobbied for this and uh, had, did everything I could. I remember really like rolling out a campaign and they decided to do it. And so we had the pet store for about 15 years in Tahoe called Pet and Company. Wow. There, South Shore or North Shore? Where? South Shore. Like, uh, yeah, down in, um, in like the, the, um, yeah, like the South Shore area. Set path, we, state line is where I grew up and like on the Nevada side, but it was over on the California side that the store was. Bijou is specifically the area where the okay. store was at. Yeah. Yeah. So that gave me a playground to become deeper friends with all of the animals. And, you know, the, the bond just continued to grow from there. Yeah. I think that's a, a life goal would be owning a pet store and living in, in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And well now, you know, now we would do it differently. And actually at the time we did take in all the dogs that were local to the community, you know, so it was almost, it wasn't a shelter. Of course it was a pet store, but because it was such a small town, it was really the, we didn't purchase the dogs or the cats or anybody. We got them from the community. So now, you know, the, the word pet store kind of has a negative connotation for those that are selling dogs and, mm. things and stuff like that. Um, so now we would do it in a different way, but I love the organizations that do nowadays have all the natural pet foods. Of course, that's my thing. So those little boutique places, but they'll bring in all the rescues all the time. So all weekend when you stop in, you'll see some dogs. So yeah, that would be the way to do it when you, when you're ready to open your pet store. Yeah. And I forgot to mention in the, in, in your intro that you actually board dogs, um, have a, a dog boarding at your home there and we do dogs yeah. inside running around or just like they're. <laughs> their visitors at the home there so would you do yep. was that at uh, was that at the store also boarding? Boarding, yeah we did do a little bit of boarding there um and now it's really we call it b&b &B for dogs because it really is just a very um home like environment with friends and a great yard and lots of lounging time and we chill here a lot with meditation and yoga and things like that. So the dogs have a great experience of a lot of calm and restoration as well as fun and engagement and training while they're here. Nice. And I get to hang out with dogs all day. So yeah. Gosh. The, dream, the dream came true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm envious. <laughs> you can come uh, over anytime. Awesome. <laughs> now, uh, I guess taking a step aside from the, the dogs, how, how did you get into... Um, yoga, the yoga space and, and Ayurveda in particular, what was the story behind that? Yeah, it was um, a time that as so many of us come to the spiritual path that I was suffering 
I was down and out. I was living in Washington, D.C. It was the time of 9-11. Um, we lived right outside the Pentagon. I had just lived there for a few weeks. I was so lost. I had moved with my former, former boyfriend, and um, he was engaging in his new job there, but I was just completely alone. I'd grown up in Tahoe, this small town that everyone knew everyone, as annoying as that was, to move to a place where no one knew anyone. And um, I was had, you know, just culture shock. I never locked my doors growing up and suddenly there's, you know, a very big city around me. So I went into a depression. Um, I really sunk into anxiety and insomnia and just was at a very dark, terrible place. The relationship that I had moved there to be with was falling apart. And then world tragedy, global tragedies are happening around me. And I did not have the infrastructure inside of me to hold that. I had no tools. I wasn't raised in an environment that gave me a lot of those resources. And so I was lost. And mm -hmm. luckily, thank goodness, the universe helps us and takes care of us in these situations so often. I started a part, I just needed a part-time job because I went back to school for a few hours, you know, nothing, I didn't know what else to do really. And, and so got this part-time job as a nanny, which was funny because I had no real connection to human beings, <laughs> children that was, it was <laughs> animals were always more my thing. Like I love human beings, but little ones was not something that I had grown up doing. You know, it was so much more, I just saw the dogs and, and the pets. Different and, kind of animal. Yeah, different kind of animals. So the, the fact that I even applied for the job was kind of funny. And the fact that she hired me even funnier. And that relationship ended up being one of those with the mom of the family and the kids ended up being one of those that changes the entire rest of your life. She was a yogi, a devoted practitioner of meditation um, into Ayurveda, which of course I had never even heard of these practices before. And she had a yoga studio in the house. So she started to open me up to this conversation and this practice and the healing, the emotional growth and strength and um, the relationship skills with yourself and others that mm -hmm. all come through these practices. So it was beautiful. And, and so then I ended up moving to the West Coast and um, it was a bit of a sudden move. So at that point I said, okay, that's it. I'm going to go back to school yet again. I kept doing that. You know, another thing that probably a lot of us can relate to when you lose direction, right? You just kind of keep investing that time in hopes that something sticks. And so this time I said, wow, this is this work of, of yoga. Let's just call it the bigger body of knowledge, just the yoga philosophy system. I absolutely love this. This is my thing. This is my heart. Like this, I resonate more with than anything I've ever learned about in the spiritual realm. Mm. So I'm going to dive in. And so I did. And I went off to an ashram. That's a spiritual community. There are many of them around the world. This particular one was the Shivananda tradition. One of them that came, one of the traditions of India that came to the West and grew deep roots here. So there's an ashram. The one I went to is in Northern California. And I've spent a ton of time there at the yoga farm. They have some animals. So it worked out for me, brought it all together and did extensive teaching um, or training there and then started teaching there and then eventually made my way to Deepak Chopra, my great teacher, who I've been with for almost uh, about 15 years now. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. I think most people, it's a household name at this point. So most people know who, who, who Deepak is. Can you do a, um, I mean, everyone knows what yoga is um, in 2019. I'm not sure everyone knows, um, you know, you describe Ayurveda in two minutes or less. Yeah. So it is Ayurveda. Ayurveda, that's the way you can pronounce it or remember, is the sister science to yoga and meditation. So that's where in the, in the world it lands. They say it's like the three legs of the stool. Yoga is the philosophy as well as the physical practice. Um, and then meditation, of course, is what most of us are familiar with, sitting and being in that space of consciousness, connecting with source. Um, animals absolutely love both of those experiences as well. And the third leg of the stool absolutely applies, as I said, the world of Ayurveda. It is the holistic healing system of India. So it's really a lifestyle uh, health system, not just helping us when we're sick, but helping us to thrive in, in vibrant health. So you could, someone could probably think of it as the traditional Chinese medicine equivalent of India in a very exactly. simplified sense. And of course, there's yes. you know, overlap and similarities with 
with the approaches as well. Yes. Yeah, it is interesting that traditional Chinese medicine from China came from India. So it is said that the oldest healing system in the world is Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. And through even Hinduism, the oldest um, religion in the world, you could say, mm -hmm. and through those traditions, all of the others were born. And so, right. yes, especially traditional Chinese medicine with acupuncture and, and even the world of Reiki, let's say more from Japan, but all of those uh, practices are very close in alignment where mm -hmm. they're considering energy just as much as physicality. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a whole, you know, system of just like there are, you know, traditional Chinese medicine herbs are also, you know, Ayurvedic herbs, for example, like ashwagandha, which we use in, in the Sunnies, uh, forever golden product. Um, Great. I forgot to do the, the advertisement for Sunnies, but Hey, this show is brought to you by Sunnies forever golden. So be sure to go to Sunnies and .com and check that out. But, um, yeah. So, um, right. So, so the, the system of course includes herbs and an overall, you know, in, intention and sense of well being. anything else that, that if someone came up to you on the street and you were wearing a shirt that said, ask me about Ayurveda, what, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that it is a natural healing system that considers body, mind, spirit. So that right there gives us an idea of where that energy side comes in. But what is unique about Ayurveda, which I absolutely love, is that it is also extended into our environment. So that is what most healing systems don't consider as much as Ayurveda. That means everything in your environment from what you see, smell, hear, what is touching your skin, the chemicals or the ingredients, the products used in your space, mm -hmm. um, the relationships you have with the people and the beings and the plants and the world around you. Um, the relationship that you have with yourself, because that's the environment still. It's your internal environment. It's your internal landscape, but it still is environment. Mm -hmm. And so body, mind, spirit, environment. And that holistic system really brings us to a space of balance. And that is what Sama means of Sama dog, S-A-M-A, -A, another Sanskrit word. Sanskrit is what Ayurveda is. Sanskrit is what um, asana or namaste, all of these words, shavasana, our favorite posture, most of us in the yoga class. So all of these words are Sanskrit. Sanskrit's the ancient language of India. And so a Sanskrit word, sama, means um, equanimity, ascent, your essential balance, your most um, core state of well-being. And that's what sama dog's goal is, is to bring all beings dogs and their humans and everyone else back to that place. Got it. Okay. So perfect transition into um, determining your dog's mind body type, which mm -hmm. is so uh, again, listeners can go to samadog.com. And Amanda has a quiz there to determine, take the, the dog dosha quiz and determine your dog's mind body type. So let's yeah. walk through that. Um, I guess I could either ask what is a dog's mind body type or what might someone learn as they go through the quiz? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for kind of setting that up because that's exactly what, what is the most important information really to gain, at least initially from Sama dog is the understanding of your dog's body mind type. And that is known as the dosha, D-O-S-H-A, another Sanskrit word. So <laughs> who knew? Well, this would be a I always thought it, lesson. Uh, when I go home to California and I, I go to the Whole Foods in Cupertino, uh, they have the, the dosha there, but it's, uh -huh. like a, it's like a big pancake with a bunch of Indian food in the middle. Is that... That's a dosa. dosa. Oh, dosa. <laughs> <laughs> but close. Yeah, exactly. But okay. yeah, all, all within the doses are within the body of Ayurveda and absolutely it. support it. So, okay, I just had to get that out of the way. I was totally, <laughs> I totally sidetracked us, but okay, back to the... the <laughs> The dosha. <laughs> yeah, so the doshas are the body mind type of your of a being. Um, every every animal, every human has this. We are uh, born with a certain recipe, you could say, and that once we learn what that is, we know how to manage better our dog's life. So whether it's what we should be feeding them ideally to bring them to balance to sama, 
or what herbs they could use to benefit their body and maintain that sama or what kind of environment, even like training and play engagement with them, um, where you have their bed and the music and the sounds that you would have in that area all have an influence on the doshas. Hmm. It's, it's all about information that comes through the senses, the five gateways. You know, the five senses are where it's at because all all of our life experience is interpreted through those channels. Mm -hmm. We are far more aware of food, right? Supplements, beverages. We're very aware of how that's having an impact on our body and our mind, even in our state of wellness, but we're not nearly as aware or put as much attention on how the other senses are influencing our wellness. And I would say too, for dogs, I mean, look at them with their sense of smell that is everywhere from anywhere, I should say from 10,000 to 100,000 times more acute than ours is. Imagine how the sense of smell could balance or imbalance them, could help them thrive or, or create a, a, an essential um, sensitivity that could you know, be a place that disease or illness could set in. So that's yes. what we're doing. We're fortifying their wellness by giving them what they need through the senses. And how we know how to do that is based on what their body mind type is. Wow, and it seems so important because, you know, we use so many, you know, chemicals and, and whatever else has, you know, is giving off a, a scent around the house, right? And to us, mm -hmm. it may not seem like it could be having any effect, but it could actually be having almost a, a hidden effect on our dogs and their you know, they're not going to speak up about it. So. Yep. Yep. They can't. Yeah, it is very interesting. And, um, you know, the way that we get to, we are making so many choices on our dog's behalf. We don't even really think about that until we pause and, and do it's everything. Of course, we're aware of their food. We select those options for them, whatever they're consuming daily, whatever they're drinking. But we are making choices where about so many areas of their life that in many cases, we're just doing mindlessly, or we're just doing what we were taught to do. We are doing what our family did or what we did with our previous dog. And just like human beings, just like human children, you couldn't treat every single child the same. You wouldn't raise them in the same way. They all have a unique set of what serves them best and certainly our dogs do too but yet like you said they're not able to communicate it nearly as clearly as humans are so that's where this conversation comes in because you learn to interpret it and therefore can have more information to make your better choices so if uh if someone were to go to your your site right now and take the dog dosha quiz at samadog.com what what would they what would what would be the inputs and what would be the outputs? Mm -hmm. So what it all boils down to are these three types, the three doshas. So in a nutshell, there's a lot more, of course, to share on all of this. And Ayurveda is a very broad system, you know, having thousands of years of history. There's a lot to say about it. <laughs> so I'll never run out of content, which is the good thing. <laughs> but, but it doesn't always make it easy to kind of sum it up, you know, and make it useful and not just like, okay, interesting. I move on with my life now, mm -hmm. but I want to leave our audience, the listeners with something that's you know, helpful and they can start doing today with their dogs. So the first thing to know is that there are three doshas and they can be kind of simplified to vata, V-A-T-A, again, Sanskrit words, mm -hmm. vata, pitta, and kapha. Vata is an airy dog. So that is a dog or a human or anyone that is light and dry, thinner bones, thinner build, have a lot of air and space in them. So they mm. tend to um, have uh, inconsistent mindset or kind of behaviors, like in a dog sense, they'll be hungry one day, not hungry the next, energetic mm. one day, not energetic the next. So there's an inconsistency because it's constantly changing, but very friendly, outgoing, tend to bark a lot. You know, Vata people tend to talk a lot because the wind never stops really. It's just always, always on the move. And when out of balance. So this type of dog is this light, kind of friendly, airy, little wispy dog. And you can already probably see when out of balance, how it could get too light and almost float away like a balloon, right? So what we want to do for our airy dogs is we want to ground them. Hmm. We want to help them come down to earth so that they're not stressed, anxiety, nervous, separation, and fears and phobias. Those are all a common tendency of that lightness that really gets into the head. So we want to bring them down to earth and calm them. 
So that's vata, V-A-T-A, one of the doshas. The second of the three doshas is pitta. And I'll just pause one moment so I don't forget to say that all of us have a little bit of all three of these. We have it in a different recipe. Mm -hmm. So pitta, P-I-T-T-A, is fire, the fire dog, fire and water. So fiery beings of pitta are very bright and bold and courageous and um, can be intense, you know, very driven, very intelligent. Um, and even visually, they'll be very symmetrical, very distinct features. Mm. Uh, pitta beings will look deeply into your eyes. Typically, the eye contact in general is rather intense. You're good, but, but they're very uh, engaged beings. They're there. So in a human sense, leaders and politicians and actors and actresses, it's really anyone that wants to be in the light. So these are the beings of light, of fire. But we can imagine when out of balance, these fiery beings that once were like super smart, you know, all of our sporting dogs, pretty much are pitta, all of the dogs that really love to engage and have a job. But when out of balance, when the fire becomes too hot, what happens? They get overly intense. They can get aggressive. They can get uh, reactive, uh, way too much barking. Uh, a lot of skin and digestive issues mm -hmm. will happen within the body because of inflammation, in flames, inflammation. It is the body is too hot. So we've got to, and the mind can get too hot. So now with pizza, what do we want to do to balance, to create sama? We want to cool them. So that's where all through all the gateways, we would make choices to cool their body mind and create sama. And then the last of the three doshas, you can see why this is not a brief conversation typically, but to give a full, a full picture, then the last one is kapha, K-A-P-H-A. That is earth, earth and a little water. So earthiness now has more structure, more stability, uh, groundedness, consistency, uh, a, a lot of um, routine by a kapha person or a kapha dog. These are the, the beings that are very friendly, easygoing, lighthearted. You know, they're the dogs that let kids like yank on their ears and lift up their lips. The golden retriever is a perfect example. Most right. of them, most of them, you know, not every breed falls into one category, but in general, certainly our bigger, heavier uh, breeds that are the gentle giants of the world, that yeah. kapha energy. Kapha people and dogs are very good friends. They're very reliable. They're as easygoing as they come, no drama, you know. But when that earth becomes too much earth, too much heaviness, what happens? Depression, lethargy, withdrawal, weight gain, uh, it, uh, a, a speed in which they start to age a little faster. They just kind of oh, become too heavy and complacent. Mm -hmm. And so with them, we want to lighten. That's the big idea. So we wanted to ground. We wanted to cool, and with kaphas, we want to lighten, invigorate is the word that mm. Ayurveda will often use. And so how do we do that? And that's, that is what the teachings of Sama Dog are all about. Very cool. Does that and, make uh, sense? It, it makes sense. And, uh, you know, I, I, can, I can see how, of course, there, you know, it's not like a dog is 100% one. And so yeah. as you were, you were going through the, the two of them there, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use golden retrievers as an, as an example because I grew up with the golden, sunny. And, um, yeah, you know, you know, with the, with the, I feel like there's, they're probably a, 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 a decent mix of kapha and, and pitta in that goldens often get these skin issues and have digestive issues and seem to be a little bit more sensitive potentially to some of the mainstream, you know, food out there, especially kibble, et cetera. And I think, yep. you know, I didn't know anything when, when, you know, Sonny got the regular old Purina dog chow, um, as a kid. And then the where you really hit me when I think about him was on the kapha side so Sonny was happy when I went out when I left home for the military Sonny was happy he was fine he was old you know 10 11 um but the when I was gone it was like a a, a part of that lightness I think of you know me being around and always with him was gone and he went downhill super fast I never got to see him again and so that oh, is something that um is uh you know comes to mind when i think of think of of him so i know we have a, got a lot of golden retriever listeners so that's what mm -hmm. what comes to mind it, it's that you know he needed a lot more you know interaction and mm -hmm. and kind of the the care and attention that 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 i brought of course i had other family members but um mm -hmm. anyway so uh, on the on the first um 
um, the first the first one you mentioned was what the, vata vata so what's an example you you touched that you know some dogs might have some breeds might tend to one or more of the uh, mm -hmm. of the three so what's it would be an example of a breed that might fit into the vata mm -hmm. certainly skinny ones like greyhounds and whippets mm -hmm. and things like that i see a lot of poodles that have like that nervous more kind of nervous yappier energy um my cockapoo is very very vata she's the one that actually got me into the work of ayurveda for dogs that's a whole oh, well. other story but she just got so sick and no one could fix her and what it ended up being was she was extremely vata imbalanced mm -hmm. And so that's what I realized is, okay, let me try to, through her five senses, provide her the nourishment that I know helps vatas and just do it like in a dog version. So I would just look up all the different things I was trying to do online and see if there was any, um, you know, anything to be concerned with. And if it mm -hmm. seemed like green light, I would go for it. And within a few months, Maya, who was dying, she was literally couple weeks away from the end she made a full recovery and is still a thriving happy still vata you know that once you are what you you are that formula you are that recipe for the rest of your life but you can get out of balance in each of them so mm -hmm. all of them all of us have a little bit of each of the doshas each of the three and then each of us can and are being influenced by our environment by our life and can get out of balance in all three like we, we i think we all can relate to a vata imbalance where we get nervous and anxious mm -hmm. and has some anxiety or pitta imbalance where we're just too intense and driven in our work or what our perspective you know our point of view or kapha where we just don't want to do anything we get lazy and we don't feel like engaging and we cancel a lot of plans and that's a kapha imbalance so you right. can see this in all of them so anyway, back to what you were saying with, with Vata, yeah, more of those wispier, lighter mm -hmm. dogs. You could say um, uh, even like an Afghan, you know, the longer noses, the mm -hmm. sight hounds, dogs like that typically tend to be a little bit more of that kind of nervous or lighter breed um, mm -hmm. that tends that way. Mm -hmm. And then Pitta, pretty much all of your sporting dogs, but certainly uh, working dogs that uh, are very purposeful like german shepherds gold, um, a doberman pincher um a i have one downstairs right now that i can hear yapping in the background a mini aussie you nice. know, australian shepherds like look at that like they are super, me, yeah. right? <laughs> his eyes just look at me and i'm like there's a lot of heat there mister <laughs> yeah so that's what that is and then the kapha more of the heavier bigger breed so um i have a great burner doodle here so she's very kapha or even your basset hounds old english uh sheep dogs um, um uh, bulldogs dogs yeah. like that you know very very commonly are that yeah, i was reminded of my my buddy uh jeremy's dog milo who was a a spaniel of can't remember some sort but yeah he was so expressive it was like he would just look at you and you was like you were looking at another human, you know, yeah. you just have these different facial expressions and so engaging and, and, and interesting like that. So that's what came to mind for me. Yep. And so you'll when, notice you mentioned just an interesting something is with Pitta, the fire one, that it will affect the hair because it affects the body so much, mm -hmm. the heat, it'll affect the hair. So very commonly Pittas will have red hair. So whether it's a person or yeah, a dog, like a golden hair. retriever, red or speckled. You know, like yeah, I have a, um, a little uh, terrier, a Jack Russell mix, and he's very yeah. pitta and he has little speckles all over his body. He's all freckled or his belly. So that also are graying, you know, for gray, graying hair, like I have pitta and a lot of vata. And so that's where the gray came when I was very young, curly hair. So a lot of times the hair is affected okay. by the heat. Interesting. Yeah. Milo was both red and speckled. So. Uh-huh. There you go. <laughs> pitta on pitta. Yeah. <laughs> so someone who takes this test what do they their they the output they get is okay my dog is either vita uh vita pit, or vata pitta or kapha and that's it or is there like a percentage spectrum how does it uh the test online now i do have a more uh, a, a test that is a hard copy that someone could take and get quantities and you would actually learn the amount of each of them that your dog has so i have that anyone's totally welcome to reach out to me mm -hmm. at you can do connect at samadog.com or you'll see an email on the website. So that is available, but on the website, it's samadog.com forward slash quiz 
or you can navigate from the bar. But um, what you'll do is you go through, you answer the questions, uh, what is most like your dog, what their hair type, how their bark tendency is, their mm -hmm. digestive stability or instability. So you'll go through and you'll answer those questions. And then it shows you as a result at the end, what is your dog primarily? So it'll show vata, pitta, or mm -hmm. kapha as its, as its majority or its predominant dosha. And then when you click through, you will then be given some food recommendations, supplements, um, a few of our products that we have that align to that, um, some aromas and other suggestions that would be ideal for the pitta, vata, or kapha dog. Got it. Yeah. Now, um, this is where it can kind of get confusing for um you know a, a pet parent so my sister has a new golden puppy gidget and you know i'm i'm kind of you know, when i connect with holistic vests they're all talking about the foods and you know warm neutral cooling etc so avoid chicken because it's warm and golden generally tend to be need a little bit more cooling so how would how does that um overlap interact conflict with um the ayurveda approach when it when it comes to food for example of, of specifically of warm cooling neutral yep. meats yep i know exactly what you're speaking of and th great question because it absolutely aligns 100 percent and that's what anytime i'll have a, a chat with a holistic vet that is traditional chinese medicine trained or a human practitioner of mm -hmm. of the eastern practices will be able to compare go back and forth and see that it's it's the same so the chicken is heating indeed and that's why your pizza type of dog would not be good on that chicken also has a tendency to uh, overstimulate the skin or be allergen mm -hmm. likely and again the pizzas can't handle that also chicken for vata it's not only heating it's energizing it's ad you could say agitating think of the energy of an actual chicken they're like all over right. the place right yeah. so for a vata as you can imagine that's ungrounded and nervous and skinny then the uh, energy of a chicken is not going to serve it's best either. to that sometimes exactly where on the opposite side that heavier more complacent lethargic dog actually would be benefited by warming up and creating a little more energy within the body so the, it very much aligns the same where some of the warming meats, to be specific to answer your question, the warming meats would be ideal for vata because vatas are more cold. The cooling are ideal for pitta because pittas are more hot. And the neutral are ideal for kapha because kaphas are just that. They're neutral. But mm -hmm. if they're out of balance, you want to warm them up a little bit. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for just for those who are listening who haven't listened to some other episodes, examples of warming meats would be chicken. Um, venison is known as actually like a kind of very hot meat. Neutral mm -hmm. beef generally, and then mm -hmm. cooling um, salmon as an example. Duck, I think, and you know, yeah, and, and some. It's not that all fish are cooling, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, usually it's white fish are cooling and red fish are heating. Okay. Think of a salmon. You know, I know you, you had uh, mentioned salmon in that uh, neutral category, I think you just said, but and at times it's put into the heating category too because, and this is what one of my great mentors brought my attention to, is recognizing the energy of the animal. Think of a the salmon. They're very intense creatures. Have you ever seen them swim upstream? They gotta swim upstream. Oh, they've got like a look on their face even. <laughs> it takes a lot. And they're all red and they're yeah. really fiery and their meat is even pink and so that shows that there is some certainly some intensity in there that pizza energy is that of interesting. a salmon yeah it, it, that's interesting but it from the tcm approach people usually put salmon in the cooling and that's because it's likely and this is like turmeric gets into this confusing category because it's anti-inflammatory Mm. Salmon is a strong, as we all know, a very strong anti-inflammatory, al almost as strong as an over-the-counter medicine. And that's because of the omegas, exactly. And that, anything that's anti-inflammatory can be seen as cooling, but it's, and it is similar, it is similar, right. but say you have a dog that has a lot of heat going on, I would just choose a different meat you know, for that, for a time until yeah. it's more balanced again. And then you can mix it in or something like that to just kind yeah. of try it, see if it could be part of the heating that's going on inside the body. So as an example, a golden retriever who has some itchy skin things going on, like my sister's dog, Gidget, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right now, what might you, what, what might they consider, what might she consider 
food wise. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to avoid a chicken like you are. And I would say if fish is another uh, bigger conversation around with dogs, but there's a, a holistic perspective out there that that fish in general is not really the top choice for dogs, more some of these other meat sources. So I would say for your sister's dog, turkey would be a good one. Okay. You can, a white meat, you know, and think of a turkey. It is not as energetic of an animal. It's a little more grounded and it's a nice neutral meat. Uh, typically turkey does not have the allergen potential that chicken right. does. So I think that would be a good way to go. And then just to throw one specific herb out there with skin problems and Ayurvedic herb. You mentioned ashwagandha, which is great for vata because it's very calming mm. and de-stressifying. But an Ayurvedic herb that's very good for pitta or any heat or any skin issues is neem, N-E-E-M. Mm, okay. You might've heard of neem before, yeah. quite popular. You know, people will even buy it like in a cream or salve. but you can feed an animal neem either through the capsules or supplements of, of, of a certain type. And that is a great supplement to really cool down the system, improve the quality of the skin. It's got a little antibacterial, antifungal, antimicrobial property. So it just mm -hmm. settles everything inside and outside. Very nice. Yeah, we we're working on an allergy product for the Sunny's line, and that was one of the ingredients that we would likely yep. include. Yep, Think of even when you have plants that are being attacked. I thought about this recently as I'm spraying my plants with neem. You know, the gardener recommended mm. it. And I was like, oh, cool. I like it. It's natural. I totally will use this in my garden. As I'm spraying the plants and I'm seeing them being attacked and I'm spraying this cooling fluid on them, I just thought, wow, there's Ayurveda right there. There's this uh, war happening. And think mm. of the heat, the intensity of conflict. That's what's happening to my poor rose bush. And now I'm cooling it out with certainly there are physical, you know, properties that are compounds that are going to, you know, that are distasteful to bugs, but there's also this cooling energy that I'm pulling all putting all over this plant that now gets to restore itself itself and bring itself back to sama, even the yeah. rose bushes. Very nice. Mm -hmm. From an aroma perspective, so we can go a number of directions with this you know, we'll probably have another five minutes or so here but um i know you have sending you have pet safe candles on your website mm -hmm. that you sell so maybe talk either a bit about that or a bit about you know aromas in general for um ayurvedic dog therapy yeah the uh, why i have chosen to create those candles i only have a few products and i specifically made them to be honest at first to for I, that I can use them, that I would have access to them and I could apply them to my own pack. Likely one of the reasons why you've created some things because right. it's like, I know what I want to be able to use. So Campbell's was a perfect example of that. I would very often, I knew that I should buy soy based wax because that is far less toxic for human beings and animals. So and, that and, is and all good. So I'm new to, I'm new to this from a candle perspective, but yeah, I'm, I've mm -hmm. been very, um, you know, curious so what are waxes to avoid beeswax they just have more toxins or and or even beeswax at least is natural there are many other properties that they will put within the wax of the candle that are synthetic that are chemical compounds like the fragrances that, yep that are fragrances unnatural fragrances and um, even, you know, ke chemicals of a different variety to make the smell last longer, stay and linger in the air a little more, whatnot, you know, cut through certain other aromas. So not that we want smelly homes, we want good smelling places and we love candles. It's a wonderful, you know, calming pr uh, property to bring into our home as well as beautiful, as well as fragrant. So when we are burning though, these lower quality or non-natural types of candles, what's most important to remember is as that wax burns, it's obviously going somewhere, right? Because it's shrinking down in the container. So that wax has gone somewhere. It doesn't just evaporate. It gets, it, it gets uh, broken down and then sent out into the air. And that's why we can smell it. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, those molecules, however, that are out in the air are then landing on the ground. Our animals are walking all over the ground. It's landing all over their couches on them. They're licking themselves, you know, unlike us where, yeah, those molecules would land on the shirt, but I'm going to take the shirt off later and launder it where animals are not changing their clothes all the time. And so they're licking themselves to clean themselves too, 
as mm -hmm. opposed to us taking a shower. And so they're consuming far more of this. It's already not good for us as humans, but they're consuming far more of it into their body. And it really is breaking down their cell activity, kills the gut lining, kills the, the, uh, mm -hmm. the vitality of the gut flora and so much more. So if we can bring in healthy oils, natural uh, waxes, that is, uh, far better. So the candles that I've created or any candle that you buy in a home with animals should be made of soy and or coconut is what we make ours with. It's coconut okay. wax and soy wax. And then as important as the wax itself is where did they get that fragrance? So there are many things that smell and we know that you know, all of the household products have these different aromas. Some of them fall into that natural category and some don't, but yet we don't really think of it when it comes to candles and things. So what we've put in our candles are um, therapeutic grade essential oils. So the highest quality and just a few drops, because that's the most uh, important thing to recognize when, when applying aromatherapy to our animals is we need to go very gentle. Mm -hmm. Most of your listeners probably know that if they're into dogs, but it's just so important. It's quite shocking when I talk to vets, how often animals are coming in with toxicity from aroma therapy, mm -hmm. what the human companion was meaning to be as something so healing actually caused them to be very sick. And it's a daily, multiple times a day, vet offices are seeing animals come in with mm -hmm. this issue. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I could we we'll need to do a much deeper dive on on that. Yeah. There yeah. There's a lot to say because then think of, oh, I won't even get on my soapbox, but I almost want to is with Febreze and Swifter oh, and yeah. brands that I was just at Target yesterday and there was a Swifter that has animals on the cover and it's targeting animals. And if you were to just do a little research on the effect of Swifter on animals and how many animals they've killed with that to toxic chemical, mm -hmm. it's shocking that they would then market to that being. But the human in between there, the one making the decisions on the behalf of their animal don't know. And they see the marketing and, and we're all pulled into it. So that's where education and your podcast is absolutely the most important thing that we can be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, um, yeah, it's, People really need to educate them, them themselves to understand, you know, and in general, it's, I always take, just take the approach of, you know, the more mass market the brand, the more likely that they are driven by profits and are likely taking shortcuts that are going to have these synthetic ingredients, which may or may not be harmful. But I mean, there's so many ingredients that are allowed in the, in the U S marketplace that are not allowed in, that are banned in Europe, for example. Yes. Hundreds. The list is just endless. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily for the government being the one to, to say to be the one to ban them. But, um, it, you know, the most important thing is us as consumers should recognize that, hey, we need to inform ourselves. We're, we're, the, mo we're the ones responsible for this. And, you know, the interesting thing is that, the, that dogs are often much more sensitive to <clears throat> these unnatural, the unnatural environment, whether it's, you know, food and high carbohydrate content in food or, or the you know aromas and fragrances it's something that i had never you know really thought enough about until we started talking so <clears throat> really mm -hmm. glad we we covered it here mm -hmm. yeah well thank you and it's so true because they are so sensory oriented you know that's why they can serve us so well they pick up on mm -hmm. the subtle shifts in our blood chemistry or the um you know the different smells on our breath even and so if they're that in tune just imagine how if you're you come in your house and it smells like bleach because you just bleached your kitchen floor imagine what that is like for your dog and i'll just finish the thought on fragrance aroma around and just let's call them toxins in the environment around looking at how the the um, increase in the tendency of canine cancer and there are direct links between the toxins and the cancer. We're seeing more and more in humans, and it certainly is there for our dogs, if not even more so because of what we've said, their sensitivity. Yeah, 100%. And yeah. that's why, you know, in our Forever Golden product for Sunnies, for example, we have so many, you know, we have chlorella in there and al organic alfalfa juice, et cetera, that right. are meant to be detoxifying, um, yep. mushroom, et cetera, all these things that are meant to defend against, you know, the unknowns, right? It's really easy yeah. to you know, change your dog's food and see, and see an impact there. But, you know, I always think back to Sonny, what was it that caused him to go, you know, downhill sooner rather than later. And yeah. so it's the unknowns defending yeah. against those things. So, yeah. Yeah. um, all right, Amanda, uh, we're <laughs> probably just about wrap up here. Anything else that you'd like to 
share with our listeners? <laughs> Benny's at the door. He's right here barking uh-huh. at the door to demand to be let in. Ah, let him in. <laughs> All right, hold on. Yeah, let no Benny in. Go for it. <laughs> and Graham is just sitting there on the couch, very well behaved. Come on in, Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> There he is. He made his appearance. He's feisty. You can tell. That's the Jack yeah. Russell that I was talking yeah. about, the Pitta. This one's Kaffa. He's a very calm guy. Hey, Graham, inappropriate for video. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> PG. Keep it PG here. <laughs> <laughs> we can just cover him. But he is a couch potato, so he is a very Kaffa hound dog for Benny. The Jack Russell mix is very Pitta. Right. <laughs> so uh, in summary, uh, I think the more my, my, my deepest desire for people in this world that love their canine companions is very much what we just said, is to educate yourself, to open up beyond what your conventional vet tells you or your family did, and learn that just the same way that a natural environment serves us extremely well and will have a huge impact on our life and the length of it It is absolutely that way for our dogs if not even more and the more aware we are the better we can do for them and it will make all the difference whether it's just their physical health or their mental health and their behavior the relationship that they have with us we have so much more influence over that than we than we realize and i hope that people from this conversation wake up to how much more there is and from the ongoing conversations you'll have with them from resources on my page, just mm-hmm. continue to learn and grow and make life better for both them and their dog. Cause so much of it applies straight across. So it's good for everybody. Right. Very nice. Okay. <clears throat> well, Amanda, this has been great. Um, listeners, you can go to samadog.com backslash quiz to determine your dog's Ayurvedic uh, body mind type and get recommendations on how you might consider feeding, supplementation, aroma, et cetera. And of course, follow Amanda at, um, I gave the website there, but also at, let's see, where do I have it here? Facebook, at Sama Dog Wellbeing. And every Saturday at 10 a.m. Pacific, she does a Facebook Live. And you can also follow her on Instagram, at Sama underscore dog underscore wellbeing. And we're active on Instagram, so your show will be on there. We'll, we'll post it there and um, look forward to all the engagement there. So awesome. Amanda, thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much, Tim. It's been great. Thanks everyone for listening. All right.